the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Direct, we beg you, O Lord, all our actions, and accompany them with your gracious assistance, so that all we do might always begin with you, and through you be happily ended through Christ our Lord. Amen. Immaculate Mediatrix of all graces, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> so today we have to talk about hell and purgatory, which are actually on opposite ends of the spectrum. Hell is, of course, the exact opposite of, of heaven, whereas purgatory is already already salvation. So it's on the heaven side of the four last things. We'll talk about them together, however, because they're not heaven altogether or not heaven yet. And there's a punishment in both realities. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's, um, let's situate ourselves in the proper context, in a Marian context. It's a difficult subject, that of hell. And we have to remember that we talk about it um, because it's the place where our Lord and Our Lady do not want us to go. And in Fatima, we were reminded about that, that hell is a reality, it really exists, but it's not the place God wants us to go. In fact, He has given us a way of being saved from the fires of hell. So in July of 1917, <clears throat> appearing to uh, Saints uh, Francisco and Jacinta and uh, Sister Lucia, our Lady spoke about the need to sacrifice, to make sacrifices, to offer sacrifices for sinners. And then Sister Lucia in her memoirs tells us that as Our Lady spoke these last words, she opened her hands once more as she, as she had been doing in the previous visions. Rays of light came forth from her hands, but the light this time seemed to penetrate the earth. The earth opened up and they, and they saw a vision. We saw as it were a sea of fire. Plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form, like transparent burning embers, all blackened or burnished bronze, floating about in the conflagration, in the fire, now raised into the air by the flames that issued from within themselves together with great course of smoke, now falling back on every side like sparks in huge fires, without weight or equilibrium, amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair which horrified us and made us tremble with fear. It must have been this sight which caused me to cry out, as people say they heard me do. The demons could be distinguished by their terrifying and repellent likeness to frightful and unknown animals, black and transparent burning coals. Terrified and as if to plead for help, we looked up to Our Lady, who said to us so kindly but so sadly, you have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. Okay, so at the beginning, <clears throat> two comments about this vision. So one, it's obviously adapted to the imaginations of little children. But at the same time, it conveys truths about this state and place of hell, eternal damnation. And we'll unpack that tonight. The second point is, while the vision of hell is shown to the little shepherds, at the same time, Our, Our Lady makes it clear God wishes to save souls from the fires of hell. And to do that, He wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. When the children are overwhelmed with fear at the sight of hell, they instinctively look to Our Lady, to her, for help. They cry out in fright and they look to Our Lady for help. And God, 
God in Fatima by allowing his blessed mother to appear. God reminds us that he wishes to save us from hell, but he wishes to do it uh, through Our Lady. So let's go forward and now with that proper, proper context, within that proper context, let's look at what hell is, okay? Uh, let's define the terms of the question. There we go. So what is hell? When we talk about hell, what is it? Well, it is the state and the place of those who die in mortal sin. So state, it's a mode of being and place, a location of all those who die in mortal sin. So let's look at that for a second because the, the common denominator for all the souls who are in hell is the fact that they died but in mortal sin. So what is mortal sin? We hear that term all the time, but what is mortal sin? Let's define that. Let's understand what it is about mortal sin that deserves the punishment of hell. So a mortal sin has to be defined as a, any deliberate, so known and willed. Deliberate means you know it and you will it anyway. You know what you're doing, you know what you're saying, you know what you're thinking. So a deliberate thought, word, or action that cannot be ordered to our final end, meaning it averts us, takes us away from our final destination, which is heaven takes us in the exact opposite direction, takes us off of the narrow, straight and narrow road that leads to heaven. That is the definition of a mortal sin. It cannot be ordered to heaven. It just doesn't go there. It's not one of the stops on the way. It, it does not lead in that direction. It cannot be made to lead in that direction. There's a difference between a venial and mortal sin. You're very well aware of that. <clears throat> Um, there's a difference because, because not every sin, not every disordered action, not every sinful action averts us from our final end. Some merely slow us down. Others turn us away completely. Venial sins slow us down. Mortal sins take us away completely. Venial sins suffocate and impede the, the life of God in our souls. Uh, mortal sins totally take it away. Uh, venial sins prevent God from operating freely in our soul. Mortal sins totally uh, uh, expel God from our souls. He leaves all together. A soul in venial sin has a messy house in which God is not free to operate as he wishes. He has to step around all the clutter. A, si a soul in mortal sin is completely deprived of the presence of God in that soul. He had to leave because something incompatible with his presence entered. So, just examples here. I, I don't want to stop for too long, but long enough to um, wrap our minds around a little bit of the reality of mortal sin. So, examples of sins that turn us away completely from our final end, the easy ones to understand. So, blasphemy, for example. What is blasphemy? Well, cursing the name of God, cursing God. Obviously, that takes us away, takes us in the opposite direction because heaven is about praising God, glorifying God, okay? So blasphemy is the exact opposite of that. There, there cannot be any place for blasphemy in heaven. A hatred of God, apostasy, so knowingly and willingly rejecting the faith revealed by God, refusing to believe what God has revealed, refu refusing uh, to embrace the revelation of God. Uh, murder, likewise, adultery and impure actions. These actions have no place in eternal life. They do not lead there at all. And there is no such a... Th and these, these sins, these particular ones that I mentioned, uh, are by their very nature mortal sin. So there is no such, a, no such thing as a venial sin of blasphemy, a venial sin of hatred of God, a venial sin of murder, a venial sin of adultery. There's no such thing. And that sin committed is by its nature mortal. It puts your soul to death. God leaves that soul that chooses adultery, hatred of God, blasphemy, etc. And there's no such thing as just, I just killed that person just a little bit. No, you killed that person. Or I committed adultery just a little bit. No, it's adultery, it's murder, it's mortal. Now, <clears throat> there are other sins that can become mortal by their quantity. Now, again, let's not uh, 
If you have questions, write them down. Which I'll try to answer them at the end. Again, I don't want to. This does deserve an explanation. I don't want to kind of get bogged down with, and unable to go forward. But there are other sins that become mortal only if a certain quantity is reached. So they too have really no place in heaven. They cannot be ordered to heaven. But but they reach their uh, critical mass only at a certain point, so to speak. Let's use that image of critical mass, right? So critical mass is that mass at which some reaction happens that cannot be reversed, like a nuclear reaction happens when critical mass is reached, then you can't stop it, a nuclear explosion happens. So for example, these are theft and, and lying and, and jealousy. There's nothing good about them, okay? They cannot be ordered to heaven, they don't lead to heaven, but they reach critical mass at a certain point. So stealing one penny is really theft. It really is. If it doesn't belong to you, and if the owner is reasonably opposed, then you take it anyway, you have committed theft. But such a minuscule quantity does not constitute gra uh, critical mass yet. Therefore, it's venial. Likewise, in uh, lying. Lying is always wrong, but only lies that constitute some substantial disorder qualify as mortal sins. Likewise, jealousy, being sad at somebody else's blessings, obviously. In heaven, you'd be, you'd be dying of jealousy in heaven if you went, if you went there that way. But it reaches its, its critical mass only at a certain point when it constitutes a substantial disorder. And then there's other ones that merely slow us down. By their, by their nature, they're venial, unless some extrinsic circumstance comes into play. But by their nature, they're venial. It's some good action that is committed excessively. For example, um, uh, let's, say, um, let's say eating, okay? So eating is good. Eating is an, in and of itself good action. It is necessary and we need to eat in order to nourish our bodies, to keep our bodies alive, to perform our duties of staying alive and healthy. Too much eating is the sin of gluttony. It's usually a venial sin, again, unless some extrinsic circumstances change its nature. So too much of a good thing. So there are some sins that are by their very nature venial because it's too much of a good thing. Laughter, it's great to laugh. It's, makes, it's, it's human, it's, it makes us humans. In fact, in the philosophical definitions of human beings, it's one of our uh, essential traits to be able to laugh. But too much laughter at the wrong time, in the wrong circumstances, can be wrong, can be venially sinful. Too much talking, too much sleep. Sleep is good, but too much, and so too much of a good thing. All right, uh, or even impatience, frivolousness, vanity, when um, it's simply a lack of a dominion over a natural impulse. So imp impatience is actually a natural impulse. That's how we react to certain stimuli outside of us. But a lack of dominion there can be a venial sin, right? Vanity too, we have to love ourselves, right? Love your neighbor as yourself, but too much love of self, again, can be venially sinful, vanity, for example. All right, so far so good. All right, so we're, this is just the, the first bullet on the first slide, but the rest will go quicker. We need to know why there is a hell and what the punishment, or rather what the crime deserving of the punishment is. It's a mortal sin. Now, it's the state and place of those who die in mortal sin. So the souls of the damned are not annihilated. They are not destroyed by God or reduced to nothing. No, they, they uh, maintain their existence. But it's an existence, again, of, of pain and punishment. A little uh, word about um, uh, mortal sins. Um, let me read to you from, from the scripture. St. Paul, as, as in his first letter to the Corinthians, has a beautiful passage about uh, the sins that exclude one from the kingdom of heaven, and then a follow-up passage that I'll read to you and then comment on. So he tells us about the reality of sin and its consequences. He says, Do you not know that the unjust will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor robbers will inherit the kingdom of God. So yes, these are, these are all, it's a list of sins. If you knowingly and willingly engage in these, live in these, and die in these sins, don't want to let go of them, well, you've chosen a direction opposite of heaven. 
you've gotten on a plane that is going in the direction opposite of heaven. Once you, once you board that plane, it's going to take you to your destination. You can't get off. Heaven, hell is one of the last things. But then St. Paul goes on and says, after listing all these sins, then he says, that is what some of you used to be, robbers, and drunkards, slanderers, adulterers, etc. So don't forget that. That is what some of you used to be, but now you have had yourselves washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. This is important to remember, again, because again, if somebody is living in sin, well, he can be washed of it. Life is for that purpose, you know, to change our minds if somebody is in sin and to convert to God. And for those who have already converted, well, remember, you converted from something, you know, before you now look at everybody else as sinners, remember, you used, to, you used to be somewhere on this list, you know, and then by grace of God, you have converted. You have been uh, converted by Our Lady's mediation, by the, by the maternal care of her immaculate heart, you have been turned to Christ. All right. So, now, all of you pray the rosary every day, I'm sure. We're talking about, we began talking about Our Lady of Fatima, and she said, I want you to pray the rosary every day. So I know all of you prayed at least once a day, so you're familiar with the Apostles' Creed. And there in the Apostles' Creed, we say that Christ did what? He descended into hell. That's, that's crazy. So did, did Christ descend into this hell, the place of those who die in mortal sin? Is that, is that, well, what's the answer? Yes or no? Who's, who's willing to, uh, to, 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 to give an answer? Over there. It wasn't hell like hell with the sinners go. What? Okay. Where was it? It was in the earth. In the, in, the way I was taught in the uh, Hebrew scriptures, it was three Hell being three All right, you've got the answer. All right, I'll, I'll take over because I've got the microphone. Okay, good. <laughs> Dennis had the answer. Good. So, no, Christ did not descend into this hell, the place of those who are damned. He descended into Sheol, which is the Hebrew word, for the place of where, where all the just of the Old Testament were awaiting their entrance into heaven. So a quick explanation of this. This, this too is important. So um, the English translation, hell, uh, but also it's true in, in, other, in some other languages, is a little misleading because it, it's, it's, it's one word that designates different realities. So hell in English can designate hell of the damned or hell as in the Hebrew, uh, Hebrew Sheol. Now Sheol is where Christ descended into. It's that place, again I repeat, where the souls of those who died before Christ, but who died in friendship with God, in grace of God, were awaiting the opening of the gates of heaven so that they could enter with Christ. He dies. On Holy Saturday, he descends into hell, into the shale, frees everyone, and takes them with himself to heaven. Now, um, all right, okay. Now, this is important because there's a big error. Probably you've never heard of this. Maybe you never will, but it's worth mentioning. There's a, a recent, pretty recent theologian, a very renowned theologian. You probably haven't heard his name. Hans Urs von Balthasar. Maybe some of you have heard of him. He's a mysterious, one of the most mysterious figures of the 20th century. Even though his errors are colossal, they're like elephants. Imagine you have, you have like, you know, a, a group of elephants parading around this basement. They're like elephants parading around a basement, but nobody notices them. It's just he's fooled priests and bishops and cardinals. How did he do that? I don't know. One of his big errors, the mystery, is that he says, yes, Christ did descend into this hell. Nobody goes, so this hell exists. A state and place of those who die in mortal sin really exists, but nobody has ever gone there. Nobody will ever go there. Christ is the only one who ever did actually go there. That's insane. That's blasphemy. <laughs> That's not only insane, that is blasphemous. So in any case, um, this renowned theologian says that and has fooled many into believing it, but he's totally wrong on this point. He goes on this point against all of all of the fathers of the church, all of theology, and all of the magisterium. But somehow, again, mystery of this theologian, he's just riding his elephant around in his room and, and nobody notices, you know, it's just like, so um, Christ did not descend into this hell, okay? He freed the souls of the just. Now, another little word, in the, in the old, 
original sin. Now let me just jump to a related subject, original sin. So original sin really had its punishment, its eternal punishment. So again, before Christ, all those who died in the grace of God were detained in the Sheol before they could enter into heaven. Whereas those who died in sin already went to hell even before Christ, those who died in grace couldn't go to heaven until Christ suffered and died and rose from the dead. But the important thing to remember, let me see here, is that Christ did not descend into the hell of the damned. The souls from hell cannot be freed. Hell is eternal. It is one of the last things. That's why it's called the last thing. It's one of the last things. If you go there, that's for you the last thing. There's nothing after that, no change. Souls in hell are never released. Again, they're, they're not annihilated. I, I repeat myself here. And they're never released either. Why is that? Well, it's because God has created us free. He makes us aware of our freedom and then respects our freedom. So in this sense, you know, like we truly are like God. We have freedom and that freedom is respected by God. So somebody who dies in mortal sin dies with the disposition of soul, dies with such disposition of soul as to never want to let go of his sin. And that's the problem. So somebody who's dying in mortal sin and aware of it never wants to be freed of his sin, prefers it to God. Okay, so uh, what's that? Okay. <laughs> so hence their punishment will never end either. A person who realizes, wow, I'm about, my time has run out. I have to make a choice. Do I hold on to my sin or do I let go of it? And chooses to hold on to his sin, which he knows will exclude him from the kingdom of heaven, will for all eternity have the consequences of the choice he knew was eternal. That's why the punishment will never end. So if you want to have this sin forever, you will have the consequences of this sin forever. It's only logical, and God respects that. He does everything, everything he can to convert a soul, everything up to and including giving us his very own mother. If the heart of a mother can't convert you, what else can? But if a soul nonetheless says, no, I want my sin forever, well, you will have it and its consequences forever. And that's, that's actually, a, again, we sometimes... Religion is sometimes accused of, 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 uh, uh, of reducing human beings to an infantile state. No, no, no. We have the responsibility of adults before God. We very much have the responsibility of adults before God. And he does not treat us as children. So again, the last things are truly last and definitive. This is dogmatic uh, in the Athanasian symbol, the, uh, the fourth Lateran council. All right, so why punishment though? Let's look at this, it's, it's good to look at these questions. Uh, uh, there's a theologian, uh, Scott Hahn, I believe, who says it well, you know, that uh, when we're in sin, when we sin, God's love hurts. So why, why punishment? Because it's only, it's only just. From the point of view of, again, of, of, of love, mercy, and justice, punishment is only right. Um, what is the nature of punishment? The nature of punishment has as its goal the subjection, in the case of punishment, an involuntary subjection to the authority of a lawgiver. That's what punishment has for its goal. God has authority, universal authority. He is truly the king of the universe. And all are subject to his authority, one way or another, either by sharing in his glory, sharing in his love, sharing in his own life, or by being deprived of it and punished. So it's, punishment is what? The involuntary subjection to God's authority. Either way, we have to subject his authority. We cannot run away from it either by obeying his laws and enjoying the peace and the joy that comes with it, or by disobeying his laws and then in being subject to the punishments that come with it. Those who do not wish to submit to the observance of the law 
must submit to the penalty of the law and thus they are still under the authority of the law giver. So even those in hell are not, again, they, they remain under God's authority and that's why there must be a punishment. But we'll look at that more in, in just a second when we look at the actual pains of hell. So let's, let's, let's keep going. There's, um, there's much to see here. So there's two, two um, so the, the punishments of hell can be divided into the punishment of loss and the punishment of the senses. So the punishment of loss is the loss of God, and the punishment of the senses is the pain that the damned experience in their senses. So what is this punishment of loss? It's the loss of God and the vision of God for all eternity. God and every other good is lost together with him. God is the source of all good. When God is lost, every other good is lost together with him. Okay, so we must remember that in heaven, it's not, heaven is not just a, a situation in which, you know, you, you do as you please without, without the thought of God bothering. No. In hell, the damned are deprived of God and every other good thing. Hell, for that reason, is an unending torment and punishment because together with God, every other good thing is lost and every other evil is experienced. What is suffering? What is pain? It's the experience of evil in our persons, in our minds, in our wills, in our memories, in our imaginations, in our senses, the experience of evil. All all the good that we are called to have is, is taken away from us. We are deprived of it. And when deprived of it, we suffer. When your lungs are deprived of the oxygen, you suffer. When your mind is, de when your memory is deprived of, of remembering, you suffer. When uh, your stomach is deprived of food, you suffer. When, uh, your, the, when your will is deprived of the object of its desire, you suffer. That's frustration. So in heaven, uh, I'm sorry, in hell, there's suffering of, of all sorts because you're deprived of every imaginable good. But the worst of it is the loss of God himself. There's that relational loss. Your maker, your creator, your father has become your worst enemy. You hate God. You lose the company of Christ, of Our Lady, of all the saints, and the other, and the other souls in, in hell are not your friends. There's a terrible hatred in hell. There's a loneliness, even though hell might be crowded, there's a loneliness in hell. It's like being stuck in a, I mean, there's a, Pope Francis once put it well, we live in a world that's connected but scandalously anonymous. It's like living, you know, being in, in New York City, where you're dying for somebody else's attention, but everybody else is just on his phone ignoring you. You could be dying of hunger, of, of whatever, but everybody else is just totally ignoring you and is stuck in his own world. It's much worse than that in hell, but just, just, as a, just as an image. So there's a loneliness, a despair, a hatred of God, a hatred of neighbor, a hatred of self. And hence, a, a sadness, a total sadness. Again, a sadness in, 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 in all the human faculties. Minds of fear, anxiety, depression, loneliness, despair, frustration in the will. Uh, and, then, and then the senses. We'll look at the senses in just a second. But again, with the, the loss of God is the worst of it all. Now, this, this internal strife of the soul is actually a, a very important point to stop on for a second. We, we saw in that uh, vision of Fatima that uh, Lucia saw, again, in a, in a vision, again, adapted to the imaginations of little children, but nonetheless, a vision of reality, a vision of reality. She saw that the, the flames in hell were coming from within the souls themselves. The flames were coming from within the souls themselves. So we'll look at this in, a, in just a couple of slides, but there's a real, a real fire in hell. But the fire comes from within the souls themselves. What is, what is fire? It's combustion. What is combustion? It's when um, some element, like for example, methane, CH4, is broken down into uh, water and carbon monoxide, or carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. I'm not, this is not a scientific conference, so I'm, I'm not sure. But it's broken down certainly into water and I think carbon monoxide. Now, that's combustion. The fire that's in hell is, is real in the sense that it's, 
likewise a combustion. What is this combustion? It's, a, it's, it's an internal strife of the soul which becomes totally divided even against itself. It hates itself to the point if, if it could, it would annihilate itself, but it cannot. It hates itself, everything about itself, but it cannot annihilate itself. So it wishes to, the soul, if it could, it could separate from itself, it would, but it cannot. So again, we'll look at this in just one slide, but again, so, so this, this fire, at least in part, comes from within the souls themselves. It's like an internal combustion. If they could, if they could again burn up and, and be destroyed and annihilated, they would, but they cannot. But they cannot. Let's move on to the punishment of the senses. What is this punishment of the senses? Uh, it's a positive pain inflicted by God, by an external agent, because the sinner had turned away from God to creatures. Uh, creatures separated from God have no being, can offer no pleasure. So in heaven, there's, I'm sorry, in hell, there's truly a punishment of the senses, of the, of the, of the human senses. Now, about this punishment of the senses, well, we have to stop and look at this for a second because it's problematic if we think of it the wrong way because the souls in hell, until they regain their bodies, have no senses, right? They're deprived of their bodies, so they have no touch, no smell, no feel, no hearing, no sight. Likewise, the, the, uh, the, the fallen angels in hell have no senses. They are angels. They are purely spiritual. And yet, there's a punishment of the senses. How do we understand this? So just in brief, it is not necessarily in the actual sensitive part. Again, it will be once the final judgment happens and the bodies of even the damned rise, there will be a sensory, sensitive punishment for the damned. Okay, but even without that, there's a punishment of the senses. In the sense that there's a true and positive plane inflicted by God, by an external agent, which is this fire of hell. And this pain is caused in the souls and in the fallen angels, in the form of, in the form of again, that, that sadness that we talked about, that fear, anxiety, worry, regret, frustration, self-loathing, confusion, etc. All the, all the, um, if we think of all the, the, the joy that a, any creature can offer a human being, even in his soul, think of all the opposite reverberation of a creature in his soul, and that's the punishment of the senses. Again, this punishment of the sense can be understood spiritually, insofar as at least demons don't have a body, and the souls of human beings won't have one until the final judgment. But there's truly a punishment of even the senses. Because again, the souls virtually at least retain their senses until the reunification of soul and body. Okay. Hopefully somebody will have uh, good questions about that towards the end. So let's not slow down too much. Let's keep going. Look at the fires of hell. So there's a real physical fire in hell. And this fire, again, is real and physical, which doesn't mean that it's the same fire as we have on Earth. Because just because something is real and physical doesn't mean it's exactly the way we have it on Earth. For example, is God a real father? Is he or is he not a real father? Yeah. What? Somebody, somebody said that God is not a real father. Can somebody else try a, a better answer? Is God a real father? Is God a real father? Anybody else? God is a real father. Okay? But God is not exactly like a, a, a human father, but his paternity is the real paternity. Paternity on earth is participated. The, 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 the exemplar is God's paternity, that of God the Father. It's very, very much real because he's really our father. He's really the father of Jesus Christ, right? Okay, and it's not just metaphorical. Our created physical human paternity shares as much as possible in God's paternity. They can't share in it perfectly. For example, an earthly father needs, <clears throat> needs a mother to collaborate with him in becoming a father. He can't do it on his own. Right? So this participation is imperfect. <clears throat> but nonetheless, both are real fathers. 
both really do what's essential to fatherhood. They give another being a share in one's own nature. God the Father gives his son a share in his own divine nature, and a biological father gives his son a share in his own human nature. So this way, physical fire is real, both on earth and in heaven, even though it's different in its features on earth and in heaven. For example, on earth, fire needs some combustible material to burn, and combustible material has to be corporeal. So for example, methane, wood, <laughs> plastic, hair, I don't know. Have you ever set your hair on fire? It's terrible, it burns really quickly. So, so fire needs to have some combustible material for it to burn. In hell, this fire, again, is, doesn't have to be stoked by God by, with wood. It's not that like God's always adding wood to the fire. Okay? It's, in that sense, different, but real in the sense that it produces, let's say, a combustion, in the sense of a, it causes a, a scission, <laughs> like a, a rending, a tearing apart of a substance, a spiritual substance, of the soul, which, which kind of, again, is, is, is again, is trying to, again, is, to use the expression, trying to separate from its, its very own self. Now, <clears throat> this fire doesn't harm of its own power either, but because it is God's instrument of justice, it doesn't produce a sensitive suffering, but rather a proportionate spiritual sadness. After, the bodies after the resurrection uh, will feel the pain of the fires of hell, but the, even the bodies of the damned <clears throat> after the resurrection will be incorruptible. In our current state, our bodies can be burned. Cremation, for example, you know, can, can be performed on a human body and, and, and all of it is reduced to ashes. After the resurrection of the dead, the bodies even of the damned will be incorruptible. Okay, they will be in a state of incorruptible corruption. <laughs> so they, they really won't be able to fall apart and disintegrate. They would want to, but they won't be able to. They would want to be annihilated and disintegrated, but they won't be able to. <clears throat> they will etern that body will eternally, eternally exist. So fire will not be able to destroy it. It will make it suffer, but won't actually consume it with its fire. St. Thomas Aquinas says it well. He says that fire binds the soul to their greater humiliation because they are bound by material beings as their punishment. And this binding is not merely in, ec in an extrinsic way, but also intrinsically, binding the faculties of the souls of the damned and limiting them. All right. Oof, I forgot to uh, move on to the degrees of punishment. So the degrees of punishment, like the degrees of reward in heaven, vary from soul to soul depending on sin. So there's different layers, different strata of, of punishment in hell. So, uh, because God, again, is just and punishes everybody according to his, his works. But we have to remember this, that just because one uh, mortal sin is less grave than another one, it doesn't mean that mortal sins stop being mortal. I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but so again, any mortal sin, no matter how, how innocent it might seem, deserves the punishment of hell, even if it would place you at the very, very, very top of the, of the pyramid of punishments, meaning you have the slightest punishment. Now, any, any and all mortal sin deserves the punishment of hell, even though some sins, some mortal sins are more grievous than other ones. If you murder somebody by, you know, uh, uh, beforehand, you know, torturing them and inflicting on them as much pain as possible, yes, that's more grievous than murdering somebody by shooting them when they're not expecting it so, they, they, so that they don't suffer, but both are murder, right? Aren't they? So you can't say, well, look, I, I didn't make my victim suffer, so I have mitigating circumstances, so my sin is not as grave as that of a torturer, so, yeah, but you still committed a mortal sin. So this is important. I'm, you can't read my mind, so let me tell you what's on my mind. <laughs> so uh, this is frequently invoked, so now there's this, I don't know why it's even a debate, because it's clear. So the case of people who are uh, married, in the eyes of God, sacramentally leave their husband or wife or are left by their husband and wife and engage in adulterous relationships with a new partner. It's frequently said, well, there might be mitigating circumstances. It's true. There might be mitigating circumstances. Somebody might be engaging in adultery because 
she doesn't want the man to leave and stop paying the bills. Okay, that's a mitigating circumstance. So that adultery is not as grievous as the adultery of a woman who just seduces a man for no other reason than for vanity. Yes, but both are adultery. There's mitigating circumstances, but one is adultery and the other one is adultery. One is a mortal sin and the other one's a mortal sin. All right? Or again, vice versa, it's not just a woman that's at fault. We could switch the roles, man or woman. All right, enough about this because we still have to see purgatory. So, having talked about hell at length and, and hopefully made up our minds even more not to go there and, 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 ha and after having turned to Our Lady interiorly in our hearts, looking up to her, Mother Mary, help me. You know, maybe being scared during this talk, you've been turning to Our Lady and to her Immaculate Heart for help. Let's now look at purgatory. Now, purgatory is a, a total total shift. Again, we consider the two in one talk, but purgatory is, again, we are in a completely different dimension. Purgatory is already salvation, okay? So now you can start smiling again, okay? Now we can, now we can be happy again. So what is purgatory? Purgatory is the state and place of the souls of the just who die in venial sin or with disordered habits, vices, or who must still undergo punishment for sins already forgiven. So what's essential about purgatory? It's the state and place of the souls who, of the just, so those who die in a state of grace. So while hell is for those who die in a state of mortal sin, purgatory is for those who die in a state of grace. They die in God's friendship, and that's what they want eternally. Yes, God, I want you rather than my sins for all eternity. They die justified at peace with God, but they die in venial sin, so they have actual, so, but they say, okay, God, I'm letting go of the mortal sins because that's hell, but my venial sins, I really like these, you know, so I'm taking these with me. All right, then there's purgatory. Or with disordered habits, so uh, patterns of conduct that have never been corrected on earth, okay, so inclinations that have never been rectified, so vices, that's what a vice is. So habitual ways of acting that are, uh, that are sinful and have never been replaced by the opposite virtues. Or, again, those who just need to expiate for sins already forgiven, who have simply a debt to pay off. So let's look at this. So what are the punishments of, how are these, um, well actually let me uh, stop at this for a second. Just, um, yeah, just for a second. Venial, venial sins and disordered habits are immediately cleansed. So purgatory uh, immediately cleanses a soul of venial sin, immediately rectifies all disordered habits. But three, the third point, punishment, however, is protracted over a temporal duration. Temporal in the sense of, uh, of, our, of our human language. Right, so one and two are, are immediately rectified by God uh, upon the sentence of purgatory being, being, uh, being given. It's the third one, the temporal punishment due to sin, that requires time, that, that, that is gradually purged over time. So, and, it's, and it's purged by means of, of, of certain punishments. So what are the punishments of purgatory now? Well, before we go into the punishments, we have to say that the holy souls, and we say holy souls because, again, these are souls that are saved. These are souls that are waiting for their entrance into heaven. These are souls that are, that are friends of God. These are souls that died in grace. They're holy. The holy souls enjoy peace and certainty of salvation. So in that sense, they don't suffer. They have total peace. They know, I saved my soul. It's done. I can't sin anymore. I've, I've reached my, my destination safely. I got to go through customs, and customs is going to take a long time, but, I'm, but basically I'm, I'm in my airport of destination. I'm here. The plane landed safely. And they have that certainty of salvation. So even though, again, this, this customs line or this, or this TSA is going to take forever, it's going to end at some point. It's going to take forever, and it's going to take a long time, but it's going to end at some point. And I'll be able to go into my homeland. But nonetheless, they expiate for their sins by what? By punishment of temporary loss of beatific vision and likewise a punishment of, their, of the senses. So it's similar, the punishment of purgatory is similar to the punishment of hell, but at the same time it's different because the loss of the vision of God is only temporary. 
So it can be endured with, with hope. There's no despair in purgatory. There's a hope. I know I'm for now deprived of the vision of God, but this is going to end. I'm going to see him face to face soon, even though that soon might be a while. Likewise, punishment of the senses is, is, uh, is different because, again, it's endured willingly by the souls in purgatory because they know, like, yeah, I have a debt to pay and I love God to whom I'm paying this debt and I know it's just for me to do it. I want to pay this debt. It's like, uh, like uh, to use an example that just comes to mind because I recently had this conversation. You remember uh, <clears throat> Jacob who wanted to marry Rebecca and the husband of Rebecca, Laban, made him work seven years to have Rebecca. When he thought he was going to have Rebecca, Laban was, <laughs> he was smart. He switched Leah for Rebecca. And then he said, okay, you want Rebecca? You've got to work another seven years. <laughs> so he worked 14 years to be able to marry Rebecca. And he did, again, that was, that, was, that was torment and toil, but he did it willingly because he knew, wow, I'm going to be married at the end of these 14 years. Similarly, the, the, the souls in purgatory undergo the punishment of the senses, excruciating torment of the senses willingly because at the end of this the wedding banquet begins yeah I want to toil because the wedding banquet's going to begin now <clears throat> the souls in purgatory again uh, desire only to see God that's why the, the, the punishment of the loss of beatific vision is very excruciating for them they know God is, 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 near, is, is near, they're almost there, but they can't see Him yet. And they know it's through their own fault. And they know they could have become saints on earth, and they know they didn't have to go to purgatory. So all of that torments them. There's like a regret there, but a peaceful one. And they know that forever, and this is terrible too, one of the things in purgatory, they know that forever they have deprived themselves of a higher degree of glory in heaven. Glory in a sense they have forever deprived themselves of a greater knowledge and love of God in heaven because they held on to their venial sins, because they never um, rectif practiced the virtues that God wanted them to, they never rectified their bad habits, because they didn't pay off the debt on earth, they know that forever they will love God less in heaven. They know that, and it torments them in purgatory. Now let's quickly look at the duration of the pains of purgatory. They're not eternal. Purgatory ends with the end of time. So, and they're different for each soul. So not all souls are in purgatory till the end of time. Some are there only briefly. Some are there for a long time. Some will be there till the end of time. But we can say for sure that they're not eternal. Even the person who's got the worst sentence, the highest debt you can imagine, will basically at the end of time be free from that debt. And some souls will have to go there only for a very, very, very brief period. It depends on what kind of a debt each soul goes in with. Now, let's look at praying for the souls in purgatory. There's still a lot to cover. Praying for the souls in purgatory. So, <clears throat> the souls in purgatory and are holy souls and they're members of the communion of saints. So these are, these are good guys, they're our friends, and we're, we're supposed to be friends to them. So we can offer for the souls in purgatory the expiatory value, meaning the satisfaction of the following. Prayer, the sacrifice of the mass, good works and indulgences. So we can just pray, just say prayers to God, to Our Lady for the souls in purgatory. We can have the sacrifice of the mass offered for the souls in purgatory. This is obviously the most uh, powerful way to help them. We can offer our good works for the souls in purgatory because each of these three, prayer, the mass, and good works, have four dimensions. Every good work, every prayer has the dimension of adoration of God, of thanksgiving to God, impetration or petition, same thing, and satisfaction, expiation. So that expiatory dimension, that satisfactory dimension of our prayer, sacrifice of the mass, and good works can be offered for the souls in purgatory. So you can pray for them, pray a rosary for them, have the mass said for them. That's, that's a beautiful thing to do. Offer good works for them even. Because again, each of those has a, sati a value of satisfaction. Then you own that value and you can offer it for, uh, for those souls. If you're really smart, if you're really smart, what you do is you consecrate yourself to Our Lady and then she takes that satisfaction value and gives it to who needs it. Why is this smart? Because most of the time we forget to do this. <laughs> we, just, we just forget about it. 
We do good works without even thinking that there's a value of satisfaction, and we don't, we don't do anything with it. Or we participate at Mass forgetting that we can benefit the souls in purgatory. We say prayers forgetting that we can benefit the souls in purgatory. A smart person says, okay, Mother Mary, be my mother. I consecrate everything to you. One, because I would, I would usually forget to do it anyway. Two, because even if I had to choose to, to do something with it, I don't know what to do with it, you know better. So consecration to Our Lady gives all of this to her and says, Mother Mary, you use it, you decide, you know better than me. And then you'll take care of me. Last, the indulgences are... <clears throat> that would be a, a one hour long presentation in and of itself, but indulgences can be offered for the souls in purgatory. So indulgences are those remission of punishment due to f forgiven sin that the church makes available in some days and for certain works. For example, if you pray the rosary with your family, there's an indulgence that comes with it. If you pray the rosary in, a, in the front of the blessed sacrament. Somebody I'm sure will ask the question, what are the conditions for, uh, for getting an indulgence? So I'll, I'll take that later. Now, because there's a communion of saints, you can also pray to the souls in purgatory. Again, the holy souls are part of the communion of saints. They can pray for souls on earth, and we can invoke the intercession of the souls in purgatory. So you can pray to them and say, hey, holy souls, pray for me. They can't pray for themselves in purgatory. Again, they're passive, like patients on an operating table, but they can offer uh, their sufferings for other people for us, and we can invoke their intercession. We can pray for them and to them. And lastly, just quickly wrapping up, avoiding purgatory. So, you know, purgatory is not such a bad place, you know, but I mean, like you're saved, you're enjoying peace, and the peace in purgatory is, 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 is greater than the peace you can, you can ever enjoy on, on earth. Um, the certainty of salvation in purgatory is greater than you can have on earth because on earth we can always sin in purgatory you can't more so it's it seems like such a great place almost like you know so we have to understand purgatory correctly but it's that's not where god wants us to go <laughs> you know like he, in his mercy there is a purgatory but he's equipped us with everything we need to avoid it so that's what we should aim for again purgatory is a great place but uh, and on the, on the same time, a terrible place, a great place in the sense that it's a place of salvation. Yeah, that, that's, that's awesome. Salvation is what it's about. It's a place of, a, however, where you're kind of being painfully purged of what you should have purged on earth. But again, it's not where Our Lady wants us to go either. She wants us to, again, on earth, do everything that we can. And we're equipped with everything we need to do our purging on earth. So how do we avoid purgatory? First and foremost, by avoiding deliberate venial sin. If you like your venial sins, guess what? You'll go to purgatory. <laughs> and, you learn to, uh, and, you, and, and, and you learn to hate them in purgatory, you know? Uh, you, 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 you'll, you'll, you'll see through them in purgatory, but it'll be very, very painful. Far more painful than, than here on earth. And on earth, if you stop venially sinning, you can actually merit. In purgatory, no, it's just, uh, that's all. It's just taken away from you and you can't, and you can't do anything else. Well, if you stop venially sinning on earth, you can replace that venial sin with virtue. So, correcting bad habits by practicing virtue. It's the other thing we should do to avoid purgatory. Correct bad habits by practicing virtue. Doing penance, so mortification and good works, and loving Our Lady. Above all, loving Our, our Blessed Mother. All right, wow. So hopefully we'll, uh, I can fill in the, any gaps in the, in the, in the Q&A. Okay, so that was a, a brief rushed presentation of, of, of hell and purgatory. Now, maybe Andrew, can you, if there are any questions, can you collect them? And, uh, and then I'll try to answer them. Has anybody written down questions yet? You ready? I think I said it, right? If you're ready to hand in your questions, uh, uh, my good friend Andrew will collect them and I'll try to answer them. Let's take the, ooh, look at this one. It's a good question. So, <clears throat> why did the souls in Sheol go straight to heaven and not purgatory? Okay, so backtracking a little bit. So uh, after the death of Christ on Good Friday, he goes, he descends into hell and frees the souls in Sheol from Sheol and t uh, allows them to enter into heaven. Why did they? not go to purgatory. 
Well, uh, because the souls in Sheol already did their expiation. So the souls in Sheol were, were there suffering the punishment due for their sin already. And at the moment of the resurrection, uh, yes, at the moment of the passion and death and descent of Christ into, um, into Sheol, they were ready to be freed from Sheol. So they were not somehow dispensed of the need to pay their debt as well, but they had already paid it. So that's the answer to that question. Next question. Uh, hmm. This is actually very good. So... Uh, what happens basically to babies who die without baptism? Is there a limbo? Specifically, the question is about babies who die victims of abortion. Babies who are uh, aborted in the womb of the mother have no chance of being baptized, and this is one of the greatest injustices done to them. So what do we say about them? Thank you. Is there a limbo? So the answer is this. Theologically speaking, uh, or rather, the magisterium of the church hasn't settled this question dogmatically. It's left for the theologians to debate it. However, the strongest theological position, the one that leaves fewest questions unanswered, is that there is such a place called, there's a place called limbo. As funny as that name might sound, what is limbo? It comes from limbus, which is like a fringe of hell. Hell in a sense of the place of those who are deprived of the beatific vision. So again, the strongest theological position is the following. Since it's a dog, it is a dogma of faith that you cannot enter heaven with any sin, personal sin, actual sin, or even original sin. That's a dogma of faith. Since it's dogmatic that you need baptism to be cleansed of, of original sin, and baptism is three dimensions. It could be a baptism of water. That's the sacramental baptism. Priest pours water in baby's head. It could be a baptism of desire. So a person capable of knowing and wanting knows that there's a moral order, seeks that moral order, conforms himself to the moral order, good and evil, that's a baptism of desire. That's a desire to live uprightly and live as God wants me to live, depending on my knowledge. There's a baptism of desire. There's a baptism of blood. So somebody who dies without, killed out of hatred for Christ. Those are all baptisms. They remit original sin. That's a dogma of faith too. Since, however, we know that babies or children who die without baptism one, again, they die certainly without the baptism of water. So that's, that's our, our parting premise. They die without the baptism of desire because, again, children are incapable of desire. They are, they, are, they are children because they don't have yet the use of reason. They're not killed out of hatred of the faith. I mean, they could be. So like the Holy Innocents, December 28th, those babies went to heaven because they were killed out of hatred for the faith. They were martyrs, little baby martyrs. They did go to heaven. They had a baptism of, of, of blood. But the problem is here, like, again, that's not happening. The baptism of blood. Baptism of water is not happening. Baptism of desire is impossible because they cannot formulate that desire. That's what makes them children. So they cannot be freed of original sin. They have no personal sins, so they don't deserve hell. But they are stained with original sin, so they can't see God face to face. So what's the solution? Again, theologically, there's posited this thesis of a limbo, which would be a, a natural happiness, so a state of being deprived of the vision of God, but nonetheless a natural happiness. So no torment, no pain, no punishment, but merely just not having the vision of God because such a soul is simply incapable of it, Cannot, would not be able to endure it, would not be able to have it has never been elevated to the supernatural level, has never been made a share in God's own life, has never received sanctifying grace. Um, what about babies that are miscarried, though? What would that work? I mean, wouldn't it be the same idea? Yes, yes, yes. So same thing. So any, any baby or child that dies without baptism is in this, uh, is in this category. Now this... Again, so yes, that would, be, that would apply to, yes, to miscarriages or just babies that die before the use of reason. 
some would like to say, again, some would like to say, well, no, God, you know, his, his love in the end prevails. That's true. God wants, you know, loves these babies more than we do. So some say that, well, God would give those babies, you know, even though they cannot, in a normal state, desire heaven, they cannot have the baptism of desire, God would somehow, through his grace, give them the option. That would, he would enlighten those babies and say, you know, do you want to go to heaven? Now, that is uh, like a special grace. Does that make sense? He would kind of give them like a special miraculous grace to say, okay, you baby, you know, you, you died before being able to be baptized. You died before the use of reason, so you didn't, you didn't have the capability of knowing me and loving me, but I'm going to be a miracle, give you this grace now. You can know me and love me if you want. Now, that's, that's only a, that's like a, yes, a consolation, but a, but a double-edged sword because... Heaven is for those who freely choose it. Hell is for those who freely choose it. So even if we admit that case, then we have to admit that, yes, some babies would be free to go to heaven, then some babies, because again, freedom is, some babies would be free to choose hell. So it's kind of like, instead of a limbo, then you would have like, yes, heaven potentially, but also a possibility of hell. So again, it, it doesn't really console. It doesn't really console. Again, you could theologically try, try to hold that position, but again, it, it still doesn't answer all the questions, you know? It still doesn't answer all the questions. So again, making a long story short, the best theological position is that of a, of a limbo. Now, we must remember, though, that, so this limbo kind of rewinding, 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 why is there even such a thing as the death of infants, whether abortion or miscarriage or, or anything? The death of infants occurs, why? Because of original sin. So it's a disorder that entered into the world because of the sin of Adam and Eve. So it's not willed by God. It's not like, so it's not like God just didn't think of that. Oh man, you know, like, I don't have a solution. No, God didn't want that to be the case. But because humanity, Adam and Eve, committed original sin, this disorder entered into the world, you know? So we cre like sin creates real problems for ourselves. And one of them is this, yeah, the salvation of children who die without baptism. So we don't know the answer to that question. Because again, this, is, this isn't how it was supposed to be. And as one of the punishments, God doesn't tell us what the answer is. It's like, wow, it's just like, it's like a punishment for our sins. Like, yeah, we just don't know. We know that God loves these babies more than we do. We know that theologically, we can't really answer the question any better than, than by means of a limbo. That's all we can say. Will God surprise us somehow? We just, that's all we know. That's all we can say. It's a tough one. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a painful one, very, very much a painful one. So um, before, before follow-ups, just one last one here. Uh, and there was, a, there was a part two here, but I'll skip just to go on to this, this question. <laughs> so this is a, a question. Um, so I've, I've read that in the lower regions of purgatory, souls are chained to the walls made of large rocks. The fire of hell blows through the large cracks and tortures the holy souls. Is this true? So, I mean, there are imaginative descriptions of the torments of purgatory, and it's not wrong to use these imaginative descriptions. So the, the pain of the senses in, in, in purgatory will be very real. Our imagination can't express it adequately, though. So could we use these terms, these images to express it? You could, you know, like, yeah, you'll be, you'll be chained, but how do you chain a soul? Well, obviously, it's metaphorical, it's spiritual. Uh, the, 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 the flames of hell blow into purgatory. Well, in a certain sense, yes. I mean, the punishment is very much the same, but at the same time, different. There's a punishment of senses and of loss. So some saints say, well, really, the only difference between hell and purgatory is that purgatory ends. There's hope in purgatory. So in that sense, you can express it by saying that the fires of hell blow through the cracks of these rocks. We can say that, but this is, these are images used to express something that in the end, is not, is not really sensory, uh, is, is metaphorical, but again, uh, is real, but, but again, we use metaphors and, 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 and approximative language to express it. Let me use an example here. Just uh, sometimes, you know, uh, people, uh, again, we, we, gotta, we gotta be in, in the apologetic mode. We gotta kind of be able to give the reason for our faith, for the truth of our faith. So this, this approximative way of speaking with images of certain realities that are, that are purely intellectual is very common, actually. So when we talk about purgatory, we're talking about intellectual realities, you know, like we don't have sensory experience of what, what it will be like. We can describe what it will be like, 
but these are intellectual categories, nonetheless real. But we do that all the time even on Earth. So mathematics, I don't know if here anybody studied mathematics, I'm not pretending to be a mathematician, but for example, a point in mathematics is an intellectual concept, right? It's a coordinate without dimensions. Uh, and well, how do you depict a point? Well, you have to draw a little, little dot on a piece of paper. That's not a point, that's got dimensions. And no matter how much you sharpen your pencil to make that point the smallest, it's still not a point, it's still got dimensions. So what's a point? Well, it's a dimensionless coordinate. Well, how do you depict that on a graph? Well, you have to draw a little circle. Well, that, that's contradictory to what a, what a point is, so, you know? So again, we, we, we use these intellectual, um, imaginative categories to express intellectual realities, right? Because that's just how we have to do it. But in the end, a point, what is the number five? Well, uh, the number five is, you know, it's like, you know, if I take five of these, that's five. Well, that's not the number five. These, these are just, you know, and look, like, if I tore these, it'll be the number 10. All. Like, so that's not the number five. So what's five? What's well, an abstraction? It's an abstraction. It's my mind taking something, calling it a unity, seeing a multiplicity of those unities, assigning a quantity to each. So that's purely abstraction. But how to explain it to a baby? You have to say, look, five apples, that's five. Or five bananas, okay? What's well, a half? Well, I cut one in half. But these are abstract intellectual categories. So in case you were wondering uh, about that, uh, I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> All right, so these three. Uh, there were some, some hands raised. Uh, Michaela, whoa, Michaela, and then uh, somebody here. Yes. For women who have lost their children, yes, um, is that it's the desire of the parents because in infant infant baptism, yes. the desire for that child mm -hmm. is from the parent, yes, and the consent must be there from the parent. So if someone loses a child, yes, the consent from the parent is, and desire is still there. Okay, so. Uh, that's, it, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. In, in what sense, um, and there's another question here that I just discovered, somebody put it here. <laughs> um, so obviously these questions require answers that must be thorough, and, uh, but I can only try to give condensed ones. So it's true, when baptism of water is administered to a child, it's the consent of the parents that makes the baptism happen, right? The parents decide for the child, true. But there's also a sacrament happening, a sacrament of water happening, which, which is ex opere operato, just by its very making, it produces grace. Now, when we talk about baptism of desire, we talk about baptism in an analogous sense. Okay, so, uh, and, and baptism of blood. We talk about baptism in an analogous sense, as of being freed and washed from original sin. In this sense, this baptism of desire cannot be anything but personal. It's your own desire. By the definition of baptism of desire, it's, the, it's your own personal desire that justifies you with God. Even though, it means this, even though I don't have access to the sacraments, even though I don't have access to the fullness of revelation, maybe, I know certain duties that I have, moral duties, and I try to fulfill them. So it's basically a moral, a personal moral uprightness. This is what baptism of desire means. It's a personal moral uprightness. This personal moral uprightness cannot be, uh, uh, cannot be provided to anyone by a third party. I cannot make up, if, you, if you're not personally morally upright, I can't make up for that. I cannot give you my desire. I could desire for you to be a saint, but my desire doesn't supplement for your lack of desire. I'm just, just pointing, and then this is not, not, I could point to anybody. So we can't, we, can't for, uh, we can't make up for somebody's lack of personal desire. Our desires are our own. So in this sense, it's not applicable. It is simply not applicable. If it were, if it were, if it were, then, I mean, two things would happen. If it were, then uh, uh, really the sacramental economy would be superfluous. Then th th there really would have been no need for Christ to institute any sacraments. If, right, there would be really no difference between baptism of water and no baptism whatsoever. There would really be nothing 
more that Christ gave us with the sacraments. Uh, second thing, if one person could supplement for the desire of another person, we'd have to be very afraid. Have, what if the parents want the, want, the, want, the, want, the, want the damnation of that child? What, what if they're Satanists and they want the child to go to hell? Okay, well then they, they would have the power to do that. But they don't. Again, desire is personal and, and only personal. Uh, then I think a hand went up over here. I think, Katie, you want to ask us something? Question about limbo. Yes. These children that aren't baptized. Yes. Go there. Jesus descended to Sheol, freed a bunch of people that weren't baptized. Yes. I don't understand that. <laughs> Good question. These are excellent questions. So, uh, so one thing about, about limbo. So this, I didn't say enough about this. So limbo is is a, again a happy the, the only the only bad thing about limbo is that it's simply it's not a supernatural happiness that's the only thing that's bad about it so it's, it's imagine you know uh, imagine the life of adam and eve in, in in eden so it's basically like like that so it's just like as far as the natural uh happiness of a human being goes it's, it's there's like a perfect natural happiness there's no suffering whatsoever the only thing that's missing is there's the lack of the elevation to the supernatural level of being a child of god of seeing god face to face of knowing that he is your father so that is the only thing missing of course a lot is missing but again it's not like there's like a, a torment a punishment a sadness in limbo no again it's, it's, a, it's a place that surpasses the the happiness that we could have on earth in its current state far surpasses it so it's like a desirable place to be. But it's again, it's, it's natural, not supernatural. Now Christ, yes, freed from Sheol a bunch of people that were not baptized, it's true. But those people were the saints of the Old Testament. Now in the Old Testament, nobody was baptized. Baptism didn't exist. In the Old Testament, though, the same thing applied. The same thing applied. Uh, that uh, the adults could have been justified how? By the law of Moses, and uh, the law of Moses was like analogous to baptism. It had the power to justify in, in, in a very broad sense. So they were either justified by, by being a part of the Jewish people and, and abiding by the covenant, being pagans, and again, being personally morally upright, so this uh, justification of desire, um, martyrdom, the holy innocence, or um, but, uh, but there was still, still even in the Old Testament, the same problem. What about infants that died without anything, without circumcision? Because again, analogously to baptism, circumcision was considered for the Jewish people. So what of those infants that died without uh, any sort of justification in the Old Testament? The question applies to them just as much. So again, so the distinction, so this applies again to children of the Old and New Covenant, but all those adults of the Old Covenant that were justified were justified again by, uh, by something that anticipated baptism or by personal moral uprightness. So does that answer the question kind of? What's that? Not quite. Not quite. Well, um, the question is, I mean, uh, the, 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 the crux here is just the reception of grace, the reception, the reception of sanctifying grace. So in the Old Testament, sanctifying grace could be received in different ways. Before the institution of baptism, again, the Jewish people could receive it by the law of Moses. Those who are outside of the covenant could receive it, again, through personal moral uprightness. So again, it's basically this, this I mean, same thing, but not the same thing. So yes, those people were not baptized, but they had received grace in a way that it was supposed to be received in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. So in that sense, they, they, they did what they were supposed to, or they did what they could. Okay, so for the Old Covenant, before the institution of baptism, there was a different mechanism for receiving it. Maybe in the future we'll talk more about this specifically. Then there are just, uh, you know, how about I answer your questions personally, all right, because we gotta wrap up. So, uh, oh. And then, uh, 
Somebody asked this question. We'll look at it later on. I'm saving the questions that I don't, that I don't get to for, for maybe like the final talk. Can you connect the idea of predestination and free will? I can, but we'd be here until 10 p.m. So I'll save this for, a, for maybe a future talk, okay? So let's, let's, let's close. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Excuse me. <clears throat> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. <clears throat> May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you very much for your attention and patience. Don't give me so